It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. This episode of Science on Top contains a frank discussion about depression, anxiety and mental health. If you are in crisis or need to talk to someone and you're in Australia, please call Lifeline on 131114. Otherwise, please seek appropriate help in your country. Hello and welcome to episode 269 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 25th of June 2017. I'm Ed Brown and this week I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hi. And Lucas Randall. Hey, Ed. Hey, Penny. Welcome back, Lucas. It's been a while. You've been uh, yeah. avoiding us, have you? Is it something we said? Yeah, it was, man. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, you made a joke about Trump and I thought you were serious and I just I couldn't take it. Oh, wow. It's been, yeah. No, look, it kind of, in a way, it is a little bit to do with Trump. Um, I've, I've uh, as, as, I don't know, I don't know if anyone in the show, if listeners are aware of this, certainly people I don't know personally, but, you know, I've had, uh, I've had some incidents with depression over the years and, and uh, anxiety and that sort of thing. But um, I've found things have been getting on top of me a little bit lately. And I, and I know from speaking to, some others who have similar views to me things have been pretty hard for a lot of people lately who you know people like us who care about the world and care about science Mm and and want you know the world to be a better place and humans to be better to each other it's kind of been a a rough trot lately because things seem to be going to hell so so yeah I had a sort of a a remission um you know last time I was in that situation was back in about 2011 2012 and through that period so which is sort of my first big big event and um you know I, I got help at the time and 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 uh and got better and kind of felt that it was all behind me and i sort of learned recently that that was a, a quite a lot of i think it was a, a sense of false security that uh, that i'd mm. wrapped myself in so yeah i kind of went down the rabbit hole again and um you know, went yeah, really snowballed quite rapidly. It crept up on me a little bit, and and I kind of ignored the signs because you know, if you if you're prone to depression, you you I've certainly found in my experience that um, it can it can come and go, and usually it only lasts a few weeks with me, and then I sort of pull through it. And that knowledge alone has sort of uh, I guess made me a little bit complacent. And um, so earlier this year, when I when I started feeling that coming back on, I kind of just you know went through my normal routine of doing nothing and waiting for it to pass and it didn't and it got worse and it snowballed Mm. rapidly and I went from feeling mildly down to seriously depressed and making deals myself every day to just give it one more day you know just one more day just one more day because I owe my family that sort of thing so that was you know pretty crap that's very dark Uh, yeah yeah it went it 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 got um rapidly rapidly bad so you know, having been there before, at least I knew that there was hope and I knew that I could do something about it. So I went to GP and, you know, started, get, got back on med straight away, which I'd been off for several years and um, started with a new psychologist straight away and started making changes in my life straight away, which are really starting to pay off now. And I'm kind of in a much better place and, mm. and um, yeah, generally just feeling a lot of love at the moment, which is awesome. Oh, good. Good. I'm glad things are on the mend. I think uh, depression and these sort of mental health things, we have this idea that they're temporary and that they will pass. You can be cured, if you will. But I think more and more we're sort of learning that these are things that you live with and it's more about how you deal with them rather than completely eradicating them sort of thing. Is that fair? Ah, totally. I I couldn't agree more. And And I think... It's funny when I when I reflect on the experiences I've had, and if if any listeners are interested, I've written quite a lot about this on my blog, so I've been pretty open about my journey over the years. But the the thing that's really struck me this time is there's although although you know you go through a hell of a lot, and your and your family and friends go through a hell of a lot, and and I and certainly could not um, be be more um, uh, thankful to, to people around me in my life who, who are supportive and are not judgmental and who just ask what they can do um, mm. because that makes a huge difference. And not presuming that they have the answers, I think, is also, um, is also great because they don't. And a lot of the time you just need someone who will listen. And I've had so many people, people some people who I barely know at all, like on Facebook and so forth, a few people I've met through this podcast <laughs> who have reached out to me and, and offered 
their support and their um, you know their ear and and that's that's incredibly powerful and I, I think if you find yourself in a position where where you you're seeing warning signs from somebody and and I certainly looking back was giving some out and there are people like myself who are now sensitive to that in others and we kind of notice that mm. uh, probably many listeners do as well it I think it really it's really important that you say something um, and and just offer that gentle help don't don't judge don't don't tell them what you what you you know think they should do just just offer them an ear and and that and it really really helps and there's a few people that that have you know were there for me in in particularly dire moments that i i i just i'll be forever grateful for um and and previously you know several years ago when i had my first you know big event that that i had the similar thing there were a few people who were there and they've become incredibly close friends now and and i and i cherish them so you know it's one of those weird things that you you don't really wish it on anyone but it also delivers these um a friendships and relationships that you didn't have previously in my case but but also insights into just the human condition that you just didn't have before and i you know i really think um i'm not sure that i would trade that which is kind of weird to say but it's Mm. It just it really has given me an insight that I, I was lacking before and I, I I really hope that it's made me more empathetic. I mean I, I think I'm fairly empathetic anyway, but I, I think it it really yeah, it just gives you an appreciation. That that's that's pretty cool. It reminds me of uh, Stephen Fry's uh, documentary on uh, bipolar disease, The Secret Life of the Manic Depressive, where he goes and talks yeah, to people yep. who have bipolar and uh, other mental issues. And he asks him, you know, if there was a, a pill or a treatment that you could take right now to get rid of the uh, bipolar disease and be normal, in quotes, sort of thing, would you take it? Mm. And overwhelmingly, they say no. Say it's no. that creative yeah. aspect that comes out as a result of it or whatever. And sure, there's ups and downs and there's really dark moments, but there are really good moments as well from it. And it's, it's an interesting thing to think about, you know, would you take something that fundamentally changes who you are in order to cure and this, negative Yeah, effects? I mean... It, it really, as I said, it, it, because it, it has, in my case, and, I, and certainly others that I've spoken to, and this is, I can't speak for everyone's experience because they're all mm. going to be different. But in my yeah. case, I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. I just, you know, the experiences and the relationships that that it's given me are, are, are so cherished to me that, yeah, I, I would never trade that. But. You know, it also, as I say, I think it makes you sort of hyper aware of the signs in other people as well, mm. and 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 especially, you know, as I have over the, over the years, because I've been quite open about this and I've discussed it, and that's really, it's been my, it's been in a way the thing that's given me solace with with this journey that the fact that I made a decision pretty early on that I would be open about it and I would share it, and I've had so many people come up to me in the workplace and and um, and through other you know channels. And and speak to me about their journey that they're on. Many of whom were right at the beginning of it. Many of whom had never spoken to anyone else before, and that is amazing. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's it's really. I mean, it's it's a big responsibility to have as well. But but I but I think that's that's another thing that I've I've learned o- over time is not to try and take everything on as my responsibility. But but again, just to 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 let people know that it's it is a part of the human condition it is incredibly common it's now one of the biggest health issues in the world um you know mental health across the board you know all sorts of different things and it is so easy i think particularly in a culture particularly in a culture like we have with men right now in this country where they're being conditioned not to share their feelings and not to discuss those sorts of things with mates many 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 guy relationships where well, you and I are different Ed because we're both sex, right? <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of guys in this country who simply are not they've never had that type of relationship with with another dude to discuss how they feel on those sort of levels and and this is something that I'm a little bit envious sometimes of some women and I do say this is not a generalization this is just some women who 
who have that part of their lives that they do step out of work and and for at least a little while are having children and have the mothers groups mm. I, i've seen so many women who have made who've forged long-term friendships out of those that you know i'll often work from from a cafe near near home just to be around people because i work from home and that's part of my problem to be honest but um <laughs> when i'm working there i i sometimes overhear some of the conversations they're having and i think to myself guys just don't discuss this stuff or most guys don't discuss this sort of thing um and and it's it really is important i think that that people feel that they can and that the friends aren't judging them for for that um of course, everything else that goes along with being a mum and 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 the career impact and 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 the mother guilt and all that sort of stuff. Well, that you can keep that. Um, <laughs> that's that's um, yeah, that sucks. But uh, but yeah, that's that's one thing that I think is is um, is to be admired. And I just yeah, I think we we as those of us who are parents or uncles or aunties or grandparents or whatever, I think we need to take a more active role and encouraging that in our boys in our in our you know in our kids that Mm -hmm. that we don't expect them to suck it up and to you know pretend it's not a problem and to just not talk about it because that festers and it's not good for you so there's a challenge listeners (laughs) Um, be there for your kids and tell Uh, them especially the boys that they can share their feelings yeah. Also, uh, you were talking about being open about your uh, mental health and that sort of thing and, and sort of educating people about what it's like to go through it. Uh, if you're okay with it, I also want to put a link in the show notes to a blog post you did uh, a month or so ago um, about talking to your boss about your mental health uh, issues and the different ways that managers can handle that sort of information, what they can do about it or or not do about it, as it were. Um, which yeah. was really, really informative and interesting. And I, uh, if, if you're okay with that, I'll post that on the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. I suggest people yeah, check sure. it out. Very, very cool. Yep, yeah, absolutely. That that post has had, you know, it had quite a lot of interest for a few days and, of course, you know, drops off the radar mm. after that. But, sure. Um, but, yeah, it is it is a hard thing. And, and being open about it is a personal choice that, that people have to make because there are – risks there's definitely risks with doing that there's professional risks there's personal risks there's mm. risks to your family um it opens up conversations that you may not have wanted to have but for me i i'm so glad that i've been open about it because it's it's really it's really helped me enormously for sure good and hopefully it's helped someone else yeah well definitely we appreciate your candor and we are so glad that things are looking up and that you're uh digging yourself out of that hole. So, congratulations. Thanks, man. Thank you. So, do you want to move on to some science now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yes, let's yes. talk about gravitational waves. Uh, yes, well, gravitational waves. A couple of weeks ago, the LIGO team announced their third detection of gravitational waves, these ripples and the curvature of space-time. Uh, it was caused by the merger of two black holes 1.4 billion light-years away. And now this week, the European Space Agency has greenlighted the LISA mission, which will be a space-based gravitational wave detector. It's all coming up gravitational waves. It is. And, and like, we we were pretty chuffed when we covered this initially, and, and we've, we've sort of touched on it a number of times. And just the other day, I happened to listen to a previous episode when we had Katie Mack on mm. talking about um, various things. And we did we did sort of cover um, the LIGO uh, detections at that time as well. And the fact that I had just prior or just after the discovery, I just had happened to catch an old episode of Astronomy Cast when Pamela Gay was talking to Fraser Kane about LIGO, which had just been built at the time and what its aims were and that they hoped to one day detect gravitational waves. And I'm sitting in my car going, oh, I know something you don't know, <laughs> <laughs> which was really cool. But, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it was we, we, we waxed lyrical in that episode about the possibilities for um, gravitational wave uh, astronomy, you know, this mm. new branch of astronomy using a new way of detecting things that we've never known before. And Katie Max said, you know, it's 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 roughly akin to the the difference between you know years of doing um, astronomy just with visible light to discovering, oh my God, we can use radio waves for this. 
as well, and we mm-hmm. can get so much out of that. And this is kind of where we're at with gravitational waves. And 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 you know, if if things go the way that we think they probably well, not we like I'm a member of the community, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we talk about it all the time. But if things go the way that the the astronomical community think it will, um, then you know these will actually be quite common, and they will tell us a great deal about the universe. So this mission, this particular mission that that we're talking about here which is a European Space Agency uh, uh, mission. Uh, It's been talked about for a while and um, it's been proposed for for quite some time, but it hadn't been green green lit until now. So this this mission, this LISA mission, is comprised of space-based instruments. So if you think back to LIGO, LIGO was using laser infra... Oh, man, I can never say it. Inferometry? No, that word. Yeah, that's the one. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, so basically, they um, they they have two lasers that that travel. In in the case of LIGO, it was un- it was buried underground to sort of um, you know protect it from other things, and and they 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 travel up through these enormous tunnels, and then the the idea is that this really long beam of laser that's bounced off a few you know m- mirrors and back again would basically be stretched or compressed as a gravitational wave passed through it. So that was the the idea. I vastly oversimplified it because it's you know it's actually measuring the the in, the the interference between two laser beams and and the fact that one will be one will have a slightly longer or shorter time travel and stuff like this. So there's more to it, but but that's basically in a nutshell what it was. Slightly longer, so, yeah, like less than the diameter of a proton difference is exactly. What it was measuring. Yeah, we're not we are not talking about very much here. Now the thing is with with that with that particular um, instrument, one of the limitations, of course, is the the length of, of the of the beam, and and when you're doing it on the ground, there's there are certain things that limit you and how big you can make the beam. One of which is you know the size of a uncurved bit of Earth. You know what I mean? Like because some people think it's flat, it isn't. <laughs> Earth is not flat. And so, so when you're trying to to draw a straight line from one point to another, you you need you need it to be flat. So you need it to be straight. So you can't just sort of stick one of these lasers, you know, on the other side of the Earth and one here and go and shoot because yeah, there's a sphere. You you could bounce it off a a, a, a satellite, but they're moving and all these sorts of things. Anyway, so point being, there are problems with it. So what they're doing with this particular mission is they're deploying three telescopes in orbit, um, trailing the Earth. In, in, in such a fashion that they'll be massively separated from each other. It will have this really long beam, and one of them basically will... They'll be laid out in a triangular pattern. One of them will shoot the beams off towards uh, Satellite 2, which then bounces at Satellite 3, which then bounces it back to Satellite 1. So Satellite 1 will be both the generator of the beam and the observer of the beam, uh, or beams, I should say, when they come back. So okay. you, you have a device that is significantly more sensitive than, um, than than what they'd use with LIGO because it's just so much bigger. It covers more space. So you, you're going to have a, a magnification of that effect. I just want to say, so, when you talk about how much bigger it is, these three uh, satellites are going to be two and a half million kilometres apart. Million. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half million kilometres, just each arm of the triangle is phenomenal. Uh, yeah, yeah. But easier to do in space, as you point out. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it's 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 quite easy to park things. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure. I haven't read in detail about where they're going to be parked, which Lagrange points and so forth. But uh, L3, um, I think. L, which, say again? L3. Don't ask L3. me where that okay, is. Cool. <laughs> So, so given that the, it's the the description here is that they'll be uh, in a triangular fashion, uh, following Earth's orbit around the sun. So they're all probably parked around that particular Lagrange point. So, um, yeah, that's that's really cool. And um, then you know, there's there's a whole lot of additional uh, challenges that I have to face here. But in this case, they've actually done a test mission. So they know that the the concept will work because they, they ran a mission earlier on, which basically tested this this laser um, link between the satellites to see whether it will work. And it works. So that's really cool. So I guess the, the big news here is that it's been given the go-ahead. And we're in a time now when I'm kind of like counting every single green light as a win <laughs> because... 
you know the the US at the moment certainly for for the next few years is is in a is in a stage of 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 I guess rationalizing a lot of stuff and we're not you know a, a lot of missions that that um uh, that we'd hope for are probably at least going to be parked for a while um and considering how long mm. these things take and you can't just employ these sort of people off the street to to run up these sort of projects they can run for many years before they i mean just think of the james webb space telescope sure. it's been years and years of, of design and build and and concept you know um uh, project management and so forth for that mission so if you if you park one you know you can't just you can't just tool up and gear up really, really quickly to, to continue that. So it's, it's really exciting when this sort of thing is, is given the green light um, because, uh, because this, this is sort of stuff that changes our understanding of the universe. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. And it really does seem that the European Space Agency is moving off ahead a lot quicker than, as you say, NASA. I mean, it's a really exciting time. They, at the same meeting where they uh, greenlit the LISA mission, they also greenlit Plato, which is the planetary transits and oscillations of stars, which is essentially a new Kepler one that will detect uh, exoplanets and uh, be a lot more precise in terms of finding Earth-sized planets outside our solar system. Yeah. Uh, there's that. There's also um, they're planning a successor to the International Space Station, uh, some moon and Mars missions, and it, it seems to be European as picking up the slack now that uh, the Americans yeah. have left, which is good. And uh, an in international collaboration, obviously, is an ideal way to do these sorts of things. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's, and we've seen it before with it, with other things as well, that, you know, the US the US can't be the one that the rest of the world relies on for, sure. for all of these things. And we're seeing China's really stepping up and doing some amazing science as well. And, and um, you know, I think more and more we're going to see this, this collaboration uh, between nations to share the cost, if nothing else. Exactly. Okay. Penny, Scientific American has a great data visualization article this week looking at why there's a large spike in the number of births at exactly 8 a.m. And I think this sort of points to a kind of logical thinking blind spot where we sort of assume that the timing of birth is a very random thing. But of course, in a large number of cases, there's an element of planning involved, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, that was my first thought. One, I love a good data visualisation. <laughs> but two, I'm like, well... Who doesn't? Who doesn't, exactly. <laughs> well, da, C-sections. <laughs> because yeah, yeah, yeah. if I was going to have a planned C-section and my obstetrician said to me, now, look, Penny, you're going to have a planned C-section, so come in at 4am on Tuesday the 12th of June... <laughs> I think I would have fired another obstetrician pretty quickly. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously not all C-sections are planned, but the ones that are, please plan it in business hours. And I think that goes for the mothers, the babies, anyone else involved, as well as, of course, all the hospital staff. What I found really interesting about this visualisation, like I wasn't actually that stunned to find that overall more babies are born you know, in the day than at night because when you think about C-sections and other planned births, that makes sense. But the things that are perhaps um, less sort of less obvious and one was looking at, and this is US data, the week of the year in which babies are born and on average more uh, American babies are born between July, August, September, October, which is their summer months. And the explanation is, oh, you know, people have a bit more loving in, in the cold and then nine months later you get a baby. But from memory, I think in Australia we have a similar pattern because... I thought you were going to start telling us about when you... No. Oh, never mind, sorry, go From on. memory, our babies were all concerned. No. No, no, I think I just tried to look this up, but I was pretty sure that Australia, um, September is a pretty common birthday as well. Hmm. All I could find was a new uh, Daily Telegraph article from 2012 saying that for eight hmm. of the past 12 years, more births are in September. So I think it could be um, an American thing, but it could also be the, the holidays that are around that time, apart from just the cold. But also nine yeah. months earlier, it's summer, so there's less layers and you're more, I don't know, that seems more Randy. of a time to be getting it on than <laughs> during the winter when it's too cold to... Hmm. 
do ah, anything like that. Ah, but there's snuggling, <laughs> there's nothing to do, you can't go out. I don't know. I guess in a way <laughs> maybe that kind of rationalisation is a bit facile. <laughs> but what I did quite like is there was in America around uh, Thanksgiving, there's a big dip in birth, in the average number of births because it's – um. You know, no one's going to, well, not no one, but very few people are going to mm. schedule a C-section then if they don't have mm. to. Yeah. And obviously mm. I think um, emergency C-sections would probably be done at similar times to um, natural births. I didn't see yep. in the data any distinguish between emergency C-sections and planned ones, but I suspect if they were able to sort that out, the um, differences would be even stronger. The other mm. thing I thought yeah. interesting was um, – looking at natural deliveries, so not a C-section, not an induction. And I don't, yeah. And what I found quite striking was the, the variation is not as strong as when you take C-sections into account, but there is a distinct trend for babies to be born during um, daylight hours, which is really weird because every birth story you seem to hear involves getting up at 1 a.m. and going to, you know, <laughs> the hospital and little such and such arrived at 2 a.m. on Tuesday. So I guess maybe if your birth story involves, oh, yeah, you know, labour started at about 7, went into hospital, she was born by 3, you just don't have much to yeah. say. I guess part of that is hits and misses. You know, mm. you sort of you remember the, the late drama. night rushing across town births. Yeah. But the routine during daylight hours, maybe it's not a big thing. Maybe also just women are more – there's less hospital staff around at night. Mm. Women are crossing their legs hoping to wait until, wait until the doctor, the doctor is in. here or something like that. Yeah, I was I thinking along those lines too because um, I, I, I think um, – uh, you know, I'm going back away because my youngest is 11. But the the with the three of ours, I I do certainly remember that because I think with all three of them we arrived at some silly you know early morning hour or something, and there was certainly less um, encouragement to get on with things. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So like, maybe it was kind less of yeah, you're not ready or, yet. Yeah, yeah, and and that's the that's what I wonder whether you know when the when the um, you know, when the obs come in and you know, obstetricians come in and so forth, they, they are they more likely to say, okay, time to get you on the road, mm. you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not saying inducing, but... No, but no, that's I, true. You know, There's all those other remember, interventions and... Yeah, yeah. yeah. I certainly remember, you know, with ours that um, my wife was told to sort of like, no, you're not ready, you're not ready, you're not ready. Oh, crap, you're really ready. Quick, <laughs> quick. <laughs> so... so you know, may, uh, maybe, maybe that's got something to do with it as well. Exactly the same mm. as what he was saying, that it's just, there's, you know, they, that's when they're all turning up, the hospital staff are suddenly there. It's because, okay, you know, how long has she been in? For God's sake, let's get on with it. <laughs> um, maybe, I don't know. But it, it is interesting. It'd yeah. be interesting to compare it across different countries with different rates of home births mm. and hospital births and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. But anyway, so I guess there's nothing kind of, um, whoa, this has changed like life as we know it. Yeah. But um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting to see, but it is interesting to think about the patterns of births and this kind mm. of visualisation, I think, rather than just looking at the data, surely it's kind of helpful for planning and resource management yeah. and all that kind of thing. And as just as well as just thinking about well, what goes on, like, you know, how does our world actually work? You know what I've always wondered about and I've never seen – as you say, mm. this data visualization was really cool. I really liked it because it's very clear. Mm. But one thing I've always wondered about is the incidence of intervention mm. in private versus public in this country. Is is intervention more likely? Because my anecdotal experience with friends, it it just seems to me, and I, and and I'm stress again, mm. anecdotal. I don't have data for this, but it seems to me that going private. S- seems to often result in some sort of intervention. And it, and it might just be, you know, it might just be the, the um, you know, take this to induce and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, but yeah, that's certainly been my observation. So I've always wondered about that. It is interesting. And then you'd have to think about the cause of that. Like, is there a reason why certain people decided to go private? Well, yeah, it was a billing. As apart from just being able to afford it. But, yeah. Yeah, but you know, if you've gone private and and your rob needs to bill, <laughs> I'm just—I mean, mm. this is conspiratorial thinking, but you know, it does make me wonder whether they are okay. We're going to need to induce because um, you know, then we can bill more. But I don't know. on the other Maybe. hand, you think Big you're farmer. a high risk pregnancy, you shell out for private yeah. when you otherwise may not have, and guess what? 
you're a high risk where mm. you know, like it's it's really yeah a tricky. So one. there's a selection bias as there, well. Yeah, yeah, like you just yeah. don't know. Um, I think I've heard good and bad stories from both the private and the public system. And it's it's know? exactly why I'd like mm. to see some data rather yeah. than just anecdotes. Yeah, that would be really cool. It's a fascinating sort of field looking at these sort of statistics and the data of relatively routine sort of everyday things. Babies are born all the time. And just to look at the the, the gritty details of when it's mm. more common and all that sort of stuff, I think it's fascinating. It's very cool. It's I in, love statistics. It's weird though. Cause <laughs> I wish I loved statistics so, like this when I was yeah. at school. It's so politicised though. Like when I said natural birth, I'm like, well, that's a mm. bit of a value judgment there. I, prob- I use natural birth is, because isn't it? that's what the article said. But really... Yeah. Like, yeah. does it matter? Oh, did you have your, like, your heart surgery in a natural way or? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, I, did that, I did that broken leg setting without drugs, you know. I, it's just the best for yeah. me in my holistic sense of the Now, obviously, I think I should say I had a lot of drugs yeah. when I gave birth and no regrets, but, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but proper drugs, not like cocaine and heroin and stuff. You were actually, yeah, just clarifying that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, again, you've made a value judgment there, dude. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's not fair. <laughs> if someone had said, right. here's some heroin, it will make you feel better, I would have been like, oh, okay. I'm on it. Good to me. Fair enough. Anyway. All right, Lucas, we have talked a fair bit about the extraordinary spectacle that was the New Horizons flyby of Pluto in, I think it was 2015. But now a new target for New Horizons has been selected, Kuiper Belt Object MU69. And there's been a recent mission to view it with ground-based telescopes that has been a big success. Yeah, this this one really impressed me, mainly because of the scope of the the um, I guess the project managing such a thing, um, a, a bit of background here. So this this object that's been selected, this MU sixty nine that's that's been selected for New Horizons to visit next, it's it's heading there now. It's 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 been selected for a variety of reasons, but we don't really know all that much about. It. I mean, that's part of the reason why we're going to have a look at it. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, because we don't know a lot about it, um, we're really keen to kind of figure out well. Are we going to slam New Horizons into debris, you know, when mm. we're approaching mm. the thing and therefore not get any data? Um, you know, is this an object that uh, is interesting to us in more ways than we, we've already anticipated? Um, because we don't know much about it. So one of the ways that you can learn about things, which we've touched on many, many times in the show, and again, just the other day, I went back and listened <laughs> to the episode where we interviewed Professor Lucy Green, which was an awesome, yeah. awesome interview. Yeah. Really enjoyed that. And... Um, I kind of went all, you know, fanboy on light and how awesome light is and and how I think um, I did a bit of that we can too. learn so much by light. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? Um, so um, so we, we did talk about, you know, the, the, just the amazing information you can get from light. And, and one of the, the events that's really interesting to astronomers is occultations, which is when something passes in front and obscures something else. Um, we use occultations um, for, for planet finding. We use occultations to tell us information about the object in front of the ob- object behind. We use them to tell us information about the object behind the one in front. We use them to do all sorts of stuff. We use them to help calculate distances. We use them to help, you know, figure out the mass of objects there's so much stuff that atmospheres we can, we can use them for yeah. atmospheres yeah you know if a planet goes in front of its star the light coming through the atmosphere of that planet or well, the, the fact that the the light is 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 changed in in any way um will 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 tell us that there's some absorption going on in an atmosphere of a planet which tells us there's an atmosphere <laughs> of a planet but also that this you know th- these things are in it it's really really cool and it just blows my mind that we can get so much from light Anyway, there's my fanboy <laughs> moment. I'll just calm down. So what they wanted to do here was they, they knew that MU69 would be passing in front of A star, and there are two more events that are coming soon, you know, in July. So one has already occurred. So they knew that on the 2nd of June, they would want to be getting as many eyes on this as possible. Now, 
it wasn't easy because the path, if you've ever seen a diagram, say, of a, of a solar eclipse, they, they often do a diagram of the, of, of the globe and they, they'll show you the path where the solar eclipse is visible. And mm -hmm. unlike a lunar eclipse, which is quite, um, uh, has quite a big area of the Earth that it's visible because it's, it's basically sitting in the shadow of the Earth with the sun on the other side. So it's visible more or less to almost half the globe. The, uh, a solar eclipse is very different because it's, it's, it, you know, travels in a path. Um, and it might be, you know, it tends to, I don't know, maybe 100 or so kilometers wide or something that you'll see the full, you know, the full covering of the mm -hmm. disc. And then you'll see partials either side of it and so forth. Well, this is a point of light going in front of another point of light uh, or a point of dark. Point, point, point of light. light. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> point of, uh, um, so, uh, so that that path crossing over the, the earth is teeny tiny and not very long. Um, so what they did was they went, okay. We know from history that weather tends to screw us up when we want to look at an occultation. I think of the story of you know the the Venus um, mm -hmm. occultation um, where oh, I can't remember who, who who was it. There was Cook. a was it Cook James Cook. I've got a son yeah. on mental block. There was the uh, of Venus. certainly this. Yeah, where he went to an island and, and missed it because of the weather and then stayed for another four years for another one and then missed that as oh, well. Okay. I can't that remember who that cool. was. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was someone who's probably not overly well-known because he didn't get to record. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have heard that story. But um, So so they can be they can be problematic. So you, you do that for an event that's in a tiny, tiny sliver across the globe and then you make the event last two seconds. That's, <laughs> that's what they're trying to capture. So what they did was they go, okay, we've got we've got a collection of instruments around the world that are in the path on two different continents that we can we can fix on this thing for that period of time. Well, obviously, you know, either side as well. Just going, we need two seconds of telescope time. No, obviously they've got to line the thing on whatever. But they also deployed a whole lot of portable telescopes as well. And we're talking like Dobsonians here, like my one. You know, these mm. are these are not big. They're like sixteen inch um, um, Dobsonian telescopes. So you know, they're they're not huge, um, but really you know good enough for this and um they ended up with 54 um telescope teams you know reporting back uh with with data and and they they were hoping that you know some of them will capture this because they thought that others would be would be um you know obscured, obscured by, by the clouds yeah so to quote pink floyd so um <laughs> What they actually got was every single one of them recorded data, which is just wow. friggin' awesome. Um, so they have a huge, a huge amount of, of uh, data to go through. Um, so we'll learn more, I assume, over the, the next few weeks. Mm. But as I mentioned, there are two more occultations that are taking place. So this project is continuing as that occurs. But as I, I mentioned before, the, the thing that really caught my eye about this was was – a, orchestrating something like this was pretty mm. significant. You know, this, the path that this, this occultation took, you know, covered a, a huge swathe of, of, of ocean. So there wasn't a lot that they could do there. Uh, and then, it, you know, it, it, uh, there were, it crossed two consonants as well. So they were able to put telescopes there. The next ones that are coming up, one of them is, is almost entirely over ocean. And the other one just crosses over the bottom of South, of South America um, very briefly. So um, for that one, they're also deploying the stratosphere Observatory uh, for Infrared Astronomy, or SOFIA, which is a, a, a basically a, a flying telescope. It's it's mounted on a high altitude aeroplane, so um, that one will be you know that that has the the ability to fly above the clouds, which is great because clouds and infrared <laughs> don't really they don't like each other. Uh, actually, they do like each other and they stay together. So yeah, infrared's hard. So uh, so yeah, they're, they're using that one for for that as well. But um but yeah that that so that that impressed me. That just just uh, you know organising such an event. But also the fact that they we have such detailed and and um, accurate maps of where things are in the sky that we could predict these events, these two second long occultations down to the moment they're occurring all over the globe. Does that, that not blow your mind? That we can predict when a 30 kilometer piece of rock, that is 1.6 billion kilometers past Pluto. We know when that is going to be between us and a star that's however many light years away. <laughs> when you put it like that, it does sound easy, but yeah, <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> yeah, that blew my mind. I mean, just just the fact that we can do that is just it's so freaking cool that that you know, and we and, and contrast that with the fact that we know we know so little about the universe. It's just yeah. oh, I love it. I love it. It blows my mind.
Yeah. Very, very cool. I think that's our show. All the links, of course, are on the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 269. We appreciate your feedback, either with a comment or getting in touch with us on social media or a review on iTunes. And of course, if you like what we do and you want to help us make more of these shows, go to scienceontop.com slash donate and make a donation on Patreon. Thank you for joining me today, Penny and uh, Lucas. Thanks, Ed. You're welcome. <laughs> This episode was edited with sheer joy and glee by Marcos Benamou. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Infinity. <laughs> it could be infinity. We really don't know. But it could be. There's got to be something. But it could be infinity, right?